are really thrilled to have Ambassador Frank Wisner with us. Ambassador Wisner was a U.S. ambassador to uh, a number of countries. Let me see if I can get them right. Uh, India, Egypt, the Philippines, and Zambia. Uh, in that order, I believe. Uh, he has held many senior posts at the State Department, and uh, we are delighted that uh, Robin Meredith is going to engage him in conversation. So with that, uh, welcome. So welcome, Ambassador Wisner. Um, you've heard his diplomatic background, and I want to also say that, that he is foreign affairs advisor to the international law firm of Squire Patton Boggs and gives clients strategic global advice. So we are very, very fortunate to have him here at lunchtime. And I thought it would be nice if, Ambassador Wisner, if I could just ask you to sort of set the stage with a few remarks, and then we can get into a further discussion uh, about the situation. Let me make sure, first of all, my voice is carrying to the end of the room. Uh, if I could thank you for that, but if I could see a hand at the way back of the room, good. And so you can hear me. Thank you. If I trail off for any reason, uh, Robin will give me a quick kick. Um, Robin, first of all, it's a treat to be here with you, with your extraordinary career in journalism and um, knowledge of Asia and this country's foreign affairs. But it's a particular pleasure, Noel, to be back with you and your colleagues at the Foreign Policy Association. Um, I cannot tell you how many years I have admired and respected this great institution. It probably goes back to the very early, mid-1970s when I was responsible at the Department of State in those days for trying to encourage understanding of American foreign policy in the very tough years that followed the end of the Vietnam War. And once again, we could found with the Foreign Policy Association a ready ally, a sober judge of this nation's affairs, and a vital bridge between young Americans through the Great Decisions Program and those who had to make decisions in Washington. So, Noel, thank you, and thank you for your years of leadership, your hard work for this institution, and you have certainly my best wishes. <clears throat> Robin and I conspired for a minute or two uh, about uh, 10 days ago to talk about the subject that I'll address today. And I do so uh, speaking about Kashmir, India, and the United States <clears throat> because it's a crisis, because it's a demonstration of the issues we face as we consider America, her responsibilities in the world, and the world's current disorder. But in so doing, <clears throat> I have to apologize for speaking in the presence of a true es expert on Kashmir. We're all privileged to have with us today the chairman of the Ethan Allen Company, Farooq Kathwari, who was born native Kashmiri and whose knowledge of it, the region, its history, and its current predicaments is encyclopedic. Mine is rather surface compared, so any mistakes I make, um, remember that Farouk's been my teacher. <laughs> Farouk, thank you for being here. It's wonderful. Um, why are we coming together today? I think everybody recalls it's not that long ago. The 5th of August, 2019, the Indian government in a uh, unheralded but decisive move, our revoked Article 370 of the Indian Constitution. That in itself is, doesn't tell you much, but in so doing, what the Indian government did was end the autonomous status of the state of Jammu and Kashmir, and then moving quickly to divide that state into two pieces and essentially take control from New Delhi, the capital of India, 
take direct control and responsibility for the affairs of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, in so doing, the Indian government ended a near 70-year special status that the state had enjoyed. Um, the Indian, uh, Indian government, in explaining itself for this move, uh, insists that it is finally dealing with an anomaly in the Indian constitution, a special status for a state that confers a sort of subordinate citizenship, rights of ownership only to those inside the state, and means that Delhi's laws stop at Kashmir's doors unless used to be unless the Kashmir Assembly passed them. It was a, a measure of autonomy that no Indian state had enjoyed. But Delhi asserted that during those 70 years, the present government asserts the effect of this anomalous position had had many negative side effects. Corruption among the leadership, um, a, a sense that uh, the state continued to be separate from the rest of India, engendering that sense of separatism, denial of minority rights, since the state didn't follow central government law and practice for women, uh, a lesser status, the government in Delhi would assert, gender equality was not there. And so it was also a playground for militancy and intervention by Pakistan. So the Indian government moved. It had the authority to do so under the Indian constitution, uh, but it moved rather rather brutally. Um, now we're faced with a new reality. Uh, the state has taken full charge of Kashmir, is fully responsible for Kashmir, and India has made it absolutely clear to everyone on the outside it will brook no interference and no, <clears throat> no dictation from abroad. So how did we get here? Uh, it's important to remember this story started a long time ago, but let me quickly say it certainly started 70 years plus ago when the British uh, turned over responsibility for the former Raj to two successor states, India and Pakistan. And the basic rule of the day was the majority religion of a existing princely state or territory of the Raj would be where that state would end. So if you were a Hindu majority state, you joined India and vice versa. If you were a Muslim majority state, you joined Pakistan. Kashmir didn't follow the rule. The ruler of Kashmir was a Hindu. And so with some back and forth and a great many stories, the government of India convinced him, Lord Mountbatten included, to opt for India. And that way, a Muslim majority state became part of India over the howls and protests, needless to say, of Pakistan a dispute that erupted absolutely immediately. A war followed. Two more wars were to occur later. And the situation is uh, dramatically changed. And so today, what was once a former princely state is now a piece of its in, Kashmir, in Pakistan called Azad Kashmir. A piece of that the Pakistanis gave to China and then the Indian side, old J&K, is now divided in two, Jammu and Kashmir, and the northern Buddhist majority area of Ladakh. So that's where we are. How we got here is, of course, somewhat different. And we, the whole issue was born in controversy and was immediately moved into an international status. The UN Security Council took advantage or took responsibility for the situation in Kashmir in 47, when Pakistani irregulars invaded the territory, India sent troops in to, pretend, to protect it. That 
fact of UN interference led to the sense of a dispute over Kashmir. But that sense of dispute, after several years, lapsed in India's mind, and India moved to assert unilateral claim to Kashmir to over Pakistan's objections. Now, to all of you, many of you probably know this, but Kashmir really is an extraordinarily quite unique part of India. It is an ancient, ancient land uh, with its own language, a rich culture, varieties and styles of dress and food. Its religious practices are born of the valley. Its Islam is heavily infused with Sufi tendencies. It has a real identity, a real pride in its personality. And so it's not surprising, <clears throat> Robin, I think you would agree with me literally from the outset, the relationship between this new state and the government of India was a highly troubled one. And the trouble was intensified by the continuation of cross-border infiltration from Pakistan, which fed the fires of terror and fed the responsibility for war, war. But was that enough to change the state? Certainly not. Does that explain August 5? It does not. And August 5 came, I think, as a surprise to virtually everyone, until you sat down and reflected on a key fact, and that is there was a political reality in Delhi that meant there would be a change in Kashmir. For as long as I can remember, the party that now rules India, the BJP, has had written into its DNA a sense that Kashmir is outside the pale. One nation, one constitution is a deeply held principle in BJP politics. And the fact that <clears throat> Kashmir operated under different rules meant that it was a constant sense of threat to the sovereign definitions the BJP calls upon. It's just about as strongly held in BJP views as the rebuilding of the Ram Temple or the Unifor Civil Code. But it didn't mean the BJP government under Modi went right away for Kashmir. In fact, the first tour term of office of Modi, first several years, he pretty much followed the playbook of previous Indian administrations, trying to co-opt the political leadership, spend a lot of money, intensify security. But in the end, the BJP never lost sight of what it was aiming to do. And when Modi won his second mandate with an overwhelming majority, controlling now really in effect both houses with his allies of parliament, the stage was set and it was executed with ruthless, meticulous uh, precision. Uh, the Indians moved with no warning. They closed down telecommunications. They inserted additional troops. They arrested local leaders. Uh, they cut Kashmir literally off from the world and Kashmiris from each other, imposing uh, heavy curfews, much of which is still in place today nearly two months after the beginning of the crisis. So we say to ourselves, yes, so what does it mean and what comes next? Um, in a sense, what comes next is exactly what India has done. Uh, for India, game's over. Kashmir is now, Jammu and Kashmir are now formally part of India. India will resist vigorously uh, blandishments from Kashmir, attempts uh, from Pakistan, attempts of Kash Pakistan to stir up international sentiment. It will resist furiously, hints that China will back Pakistan and have its own word. It will aim now to build a new political dispensation in Kashmir. It will use heavy funding. It will try to recruit a new class of political operatives, 
It will redraw the constituency maps. It will empower minorities in Kashmir. It will create, aim to create in the years ahead, a new Naya Kashmir, Naya Kashmiri leadership and political reality. Will India succeed? Well, that's a different story. Pakistan's response will continue. As um, you have all noted, Pakistanis have objected strenuously. They tried to take the matter to the Security Council. They were blocked there. Uh, China came out on Pakistan's side that Indians have resisted. But largely, ladies and gentlemen, I would say the world has turned an eye away from the Kashmir problem and let the Indians uh, proceed on the path that they're on. So then the question ends for all of us as Americans. Where do our interests lie? What should we think? How should we as Americans proceed? Where should Kashmir fit into our relationship with India and with our view of the world at large? And that's a tougher question. And I'm going to speak from an opinionated point of view. Robin, if you'll let me, I'll close out quite quickly. But I believe that this is a very dangerous world. It's a world in full adjustment. It's a world in which nations are asserting their positions of power on the global stage. It is a world that will remain upset until new forms of international cooperation and a balance of power can be struck. Meanwhile, strong nations have got to work things out among themselves. And India is a strong nation. In addition, India is a friend of the United States. And a strong India and a strong friendship with the United States in a troubled world is to my way of thinking, not just because I was ambassador there, but looking at the geostrategic interests of the United States, that relationship is vitally important to us. In a world of diffused power, we have a not partner, but a sympathetic uh, counterpart to help maintain stability on, on the world stage. We also recognize that India is a, a large economy, having a bit of difficulty right now, but prospects are extremely strong. American business is the most welcome outside form of business and trade, and therefore there is an economic dimension to our interests in a strong relationship with Kashmir. And so, as hard as it sometimes seems, I think we have to look at ourselves and say, Kashmir, we can be its well-wisher. We can be a well-wisher for its people and for their future. We can wish them a better place in the world, but we are not going to be able to dictate to India no outside force will be able to tell India how to run Kashmir. But that said, when I meet my Indian friends, and I will the foreign secretary this afternoon, I'll say the same thing to him. India's actions have a consequence. And that consequence is India's reputation on the world stage. How she moves in Kashmir, what she does next in Kashmir, will reflect on India's reputation globally in this country beyond. It will reflect as well on India's own domestic order, the signal that Indian Muslims, for example, receive from this event. Uh, so how India conducts itself in the valley in Jammu and Kashmir has an effect on the internal order as well. And so, like each one of us who well wish for the people of Kashmir, we hope for early restoration of the civil political liberties of the state, for a revival of its economy, and a recognition that until Kashmir's deep sense of pride is addressed, the place will continue to be disturbed, and a disturbance that all of us will remember. Thank you, Ambassador.
I think what's so important about this region is both the very local and the very, very global aspect of it. So for, for the last six weeks, what happened on August 5th, India rounded up you know, thousands of intellectuals, cut off phone and internet service, as you said, stationed thousands of troops there, and they've been firing you know, buckshot and tear gas at crowds of the inevitable protesters um, to this move. There are about 13 million Kashmiris, but the other sort of global piece of this is that Kashmir is smack between two nuclear-armed neighbors, China and Pakistan, uh, India and, and Pakistan, and so it's strategically important, three nuclear-armed neighbors, actually. Can you talk about the, I think the plight of Kashmiris is, is quite clear. Um, do you want to talk about the strategic implications? I can, and it is, of course, a vitally important question, Robin, and thank you for putting it on, putting it on front and center. Um, it has been my experience over some 20 years that more or less India and Pakistan have learned the measure of one another. While both of them have nuclear weapons, those weapons have served more as a deterrent than an incitement to violence. At one point, there was some thought given that under a nuclear umbrella, uh, Kash Pakistan could intensify infiltration because India would not dare to respond. I believe in the crisis we saw at the end of the Clinton administration, that that myth was put aside. Um, I think they have the measure of one another. The Indians insist that Kashmir will only be dealt with bilaterally. That's part true, part not. But I think Pakistan also recognizes that it is going to eventually have to sit down at the table with India. And therefore, I tend to think, and cut to the bottom line, that a war between the two sides is unlikely. Will there be tests of strength? Will there be for further examples of terror? Will Pakistanis, with or without the encouragement of their intelligence services, military, uh, some of the radical religious leaders uh, arrive on India's shores and engage in acts like the attack in Bombay? It's all possible. That will be part of the pattern. I guess the most distressing conclusion I reach is the decision taken on August 5 means that nothing's changed, that we're going to continue to see these two nations at loggerheads, but not loggerheads that will result in a nuclear holocaust. Well, in fact, just earlier this week, to your point, the Pakistani prime minister who's here in New York for UN week lashed out at Prime Minister Modi of India quite dramatically. He said, uh, Imran Khan said, quote, I'm more worried about India right now than probably Pakistan because India is not heading in the right direction. And Khan said that this ideology of what he called Hindu supremacy is taking over. He said, the world must intervene before this goes too far. Your reaction? Well, I'm, I, I was with you when he said that and I think it's a, a statement that we all need to take and reach for your salt cellar and take and put a pinch of salt on it. Uh, because, um, in effect, we have the Prime Minister of Pakistan coming to New York before an American audience and telling the Indians who they are, what they're about. He invoked Gandhi, as he I invoked, recall. Yes, he said they're straying away from Gandhi. How about that for chutzpah? Um, and I think it will be accepted in India in two ways. That Imran Khan is playing politics for his domestic audience. South Asian nations are intensely political. But the second way is that he is saying to India, I don't intend to sit down there no prospect of a dialogue between the two sides, so I can take a cheap shot at your prime minister, your history, my analysis of your current events. I don't find it a very constructive statement. Because in the end, 
where we all want India and Pakistan to be, as difficult as it is to get there, is sitting across the table from one another. And once you start uh, slanging another man's beliefs, ideology, leadership, and history, you're only increasing the divide. So sorry, Imran Khan, I didn't buy that. Um, you mentioned earlier that, that Modi's party has d talked about one nation, one constitution. Uh, and the BG BJP has talked for years about what it calls Greater Hindustan, which they define as including Kashmir, Bangladesh, Pakistan, other parts of South Asia. Now that Kashmir's special status has been wiped out by India, is there any chance that Modi may claim territory elsewhere? No. Okay. I find that... I find that extraordinarily unlikely. In fact, uh, remembering Kashmir as we know it today, Jammu and Kashmir have been part of the Indian Union since, for 70 years. This is a, a very harsh event, but it isn't without any warning, without any precedent. Uh, while basically, when I look at India today, and I think the way to read India as a nation, is it is a power committed to stability. Uh, it is the land between the mountains and the three seas. It doesn't have territorial designs on others. It doesn't have unrequited borders as China does. India will stand for Hindustan not to see its borders spread. So yes, there will be uh, some uh, hopped up true believers in the ranks of the RSS and the BJP, but they will not represent the core political leadership of the country or of the party. I'm going to ask one more question before I, I go to audience questions, so please have your questions ready. I feel bad monopolizing the ambassador's time, but I wanted to go back to the idea, you know, early, in your earlier opening statement, you called for something new, a new form of cooperation and balance of power in the world. And we've actually seen um, quite a few land grabs or perceived land grabs around the world. We have this most recently in Kashmir. We have the Russians in Crimea. And of course, we have China in the South China Sea. Um, disputed territories are being you know, grabbed by countries in power. Would you like to expand on this idea of how we no. could better... I think this? that's a really important point with one exception. I am frankly do not put Kashmir together with the South China Sea, Ukraine, or Crimea. I hold those as separate issues. The Kashmir issue, all of us have known who've been associated with it, was settled when the line of control was drawn uh, 68 years ago, and that the right outcome was that which India occupied would stay with India, that which Pakistan occupied would stay with Pakistan. And the problem was trying to get the two sides to admit reality. This was not a fresh reach of sovereignty, uh, and that differentiates uh, certainly what the Russians did, and to a degree what the Chinese did, though they hearken back to some admiral with a sea map. Uh, that, I firmly believe, differentiates the two crises. But that doesn't answer your question, Robin, which is much more important. We are seeing a world in which nation states are asserting themselves. In case uh, we didn't notice it, turn on and listen to what the president had to say yesterday before the United Nations when he openly mocked globalists and talked about nationalists, patriots. I'm a patriot, but I also realize I'm part of a global community. But we have to recognize the fact that the assertion of national identity is a dominant feature in the way the world is going. And so reaching a strategic understanding among major powers and less than major powers is the greatest challenge to statesmanship I know today. To have a strategic understanding of what constitutes the security of a China, of a Russia, uh, 
is an imperative that our presidents, present, future, are going to have to deal with. We can't expect the world of, that we've known since 1989, where the United States could write many of the rules of the road, doesn't exist anymore. You have to negotiate a place on the world surface, maintenance of stability, maintenance of peace, pursuit of prosperity is going to be a shared endeavor. And so that means you've got to have strategic understandings among the major players. And I put India among those players and why I believe having a strong nation like India basically directed, don't always agree, we'll have many disagreements, but basically directed in things all of us in this room believe in is an important feature in helping us find our way in this, in this post-89 period. Excellent. Questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Let's get a microphone to you, if we may. I'd, I'd be grateful if you'd also identify yourself. And yep. Please, thank you so much. Yeah, my name is Jim Follett, and I have my own consulting practice. But um, I spent a chunk of time in India doing business, both outsourcing but also setting up legal entities. And the thing about India that always impressed me is that you have to be there to experience it and understand it. And so when you hear the words, the world's largest democracy, it's words until you actually get there and travel around the country and just see the coexistence of cultures, languages, peoples, and religions. Here's, but my question has to do with Hindu nationalism. My, my real concern, I was excited as a business person to see Narendra Modi take the helm uh, uh, of the country, you know, the election before, and as evidence as chief minister in Gujarat, there was a great business evidence of what he could do with foreign direct investment and this and that. And it gave me real hope that a guy like that with the right power could really unleash the power of India and its potential. However, there is a mark on that record that had to do with the, uh, the problems with uh, Muslim per persecution. So he did not come into that election clean from that chief minister's role. But time went, and then when I saw what happened in, in August, I got very concerned and then I saw what's happening in Assam and other places where, where other Muslims are being uh, persecuted for no good reason. And I worry about uh, this being, especially since that feeds the BJP kind of primary animal spirit, that that could take a momentum that could really change the culture and orientation of India. So do you see that as a possibility or because there's been so much stability that that'll overweigh one person in that position? So what do you think? I think your observation is both accurate and I share a great deal of what concerns you about India, her future, and the future of her domestic politics. Um, I frankly am worried, as you are, about the drift away from the secular principles of the India that I served in, that you've known and worked in. So I have. Don't question for a moment. I'm careful, though, the way I think about it and speak about it. Because in the end, the responsibility for managing relations between cultures, religions in India is an Indian responsibility. Uh, it's not the New York Times' responsibility. And I think we have to be very careful ourselves of being well-wisher is very different from being having a sense that we have some ownership. We don't. Uh, we can underscore for a good friend like India the dangers we see externally and internally. And it can be part of our dialogue. But we don't have a place on the stage, not from my way of thinking, not in this world that we're headed into, where we have to be careful about how we manage our international relations. I'd like to take the chair's prerogative to ask Farooq Kathwari to give a few words about the Kashmiri point of view. Um, as someone originally from Kashmir, now in the US, watching this from a global stage, tell us what you're hearing from your friends and family on the ground in Kashmir, and how would you suggest we think about this? Well, thank you very much. Of course, as I said, I've had a great, great association <coughs> with uh, Frank Wisner, Ambassador Wisner. <coughs> it just so happened that we, uh, that we were in Kashmir 
just about a week or 10 days before this event took place. We had gone there for a family wedding. <clears throat> and just a week back before that we left, and things have been, are, are terrible. About close to 6 million people, you mentioned 13 million because that's the whole state of Jammu and Kashmir, approximately 6 million people have been put behind you know, homes, it's like a, their homes, the prisons are homes. They've been cut off with communications and everything else. So uh, it's a tremendously bad situation. However, just to, to add on to what Frank said, you know, uh, coming from the Kashmir region, we have, we have been part of this problem, especially not only for the last 70 years, but for the last few hundred years, which people do not know. Just a, two minutes of a history that Kashmir, the speaking areas called the Valley of Kashmir, which is where the problem is, was independent for over a thousand years, intermittently. Then it lost its independence and the Kashmiris think like it's yesterday, it was 1586, when the Mughal Emperor Akbar from India was able to take control of Kashmir, and then added this Ladakh that we just heard of, was added to it. And then as things went by, about, um, the, the British came in, Akbar also made another mistake, allowing the British to, to set up the East India Company. And by late 1700s, the British had taken control of a lot of their areas, and their policy was divide and rule, put minority rulers over majority people. And they got, uh, at that time, to weaken the, the Mughal Empire, they got Kashmir, they got Afghanistan, they changed the regime in Afghanistan and gave them control of Kashmir. Then, um, another 50 years goes by, they wanted to control Afghanistan because they were worried about the Russians at that time. And they made a deal with another a regime that they had set up in the Punjab by the Sikhs. The Sikhs were minority over the Muslim Punjabis. So they told them, if you help us fight the Afghans, we'll give you control of Kashmir. So in 1812, Kashmir got, Kashmir Valley, again, speaking areas, got, got uh, the Sikhs controlled it. And these were all bad regimes for, the Afghans were not easy for Kashmiris. The Sikhs were not easy. And then the British decided they'll control the border with Afghanistan, and they had to take Punjab. And there was another small area called Jammu. And the ruler of the Jammu was a Hindu ruler. So they told him, if you help us fight the Sikhs, we'll give you control of Kashmir. Not only give you control of Kashmir, we'll sell it to you. And the Kashmir is called the infamous Treaty of Amritsar, which says that we sell you the land, the people, the birds, and the animals of Kashmir. So our families lost all the land. And that was uh, 1846. A hundred years later, 1947, this ruler from the Jammu province with different language, different culture, was running Jammu and Kashmir, and we came to the situation where the, the issue was whether he should join Pakistan, India. He joined <coughs> India with this Article 370 we've been talking about. This Article 370, to a great degree, was to protect him and his people. And one of the things that Nehru, am, am I going too far, too long? Very good. You want, you want to know this? So Nehru was the prime minister. He actually also is of Kashmiri origin. He did have good feelings for Kashmiris. The Kashmiri leader called Sheikh Abdullah, he put him into power uh, and made him prime minister. And what Sheikh Abdullah did was something that was amazing. He did land reform, one of the most amazing land reforms. He said all the land now belongs to the Kashmiris, not the folks from Jammu. Now, so that was a, one of the most major land reforms. But then this uh, Sheikh Abdullah was somewhat thinking perhaps of um, separateness, independence, he was put into jail. Anyway, the history of Kashmir is that the Indian government has controlled what happens there. This Article 370 to a great degree didn't mean much. Yes, there was Article 35, which is basically that no non-Kashmiris could not buy land, was not established by the Kashmiris. It was established by the ruler of Jammu because he owned all the land. Anyway. Now we come to current, and it was actually in that condition that, uh, that in the early 90s, I was asked by the government of India to come in and to see if we could help the situation. So Ambassador Wisner was in India as an ambassador, so I met him. I met the Indians, then the Pakistanis, and we said we got to come with a sensible way of resolving it. So we ended up uh, forming, but what I found was that the Kashmiri leaders, who at that time were also in jail, in the 90s. I met them in jails. I asked them, what is the future? They didn't know. They said, we want India to leave. I said, how are they going to leave? 
They said, Pakistan is going to help. They're not going to help you. Come with some sensible way out of it. And I came to the conclusion that we got to help shape the debate. And we established what's called the Kashmir Study Group with 25 leading scholars and everybody else to come with a sensible way out. So we had three words, which was that the solution should be um, peaceful, it should be honorable, and it should be feasible. But you've got to keep all that history of Kashmir back. So we spent a lot of time, and as I said, uh, there was a time when Ambassador Wisney and I were in Pakistan with President Musharraf, and he made both of us talk to the whole nation of Pakistan of something they would not have done before. That is, we're going to find a solution without changing the borders. They accept it to some degree, because what he said was absolutely right, that India and Pakistan are going to leave. The question was how to solve it. So we came with an idea that it should be given self-governance to the maximum level. Now these laws that we talked about, you know, India talks about there's a minority is not treated well. All of that is not, in, in practice, that did not happen. Those laws could be changed. However, the solution was to give the Kashmiri people, especially the Kashmiri region people, as I said, the ability to govern themselves, Muslims and Hindus. Kashmiri Hindus also suffered. Many of them left or were thrown out. So it almost came to a situation they both agreed. So there is a precedent that India and Pakistan, President Musharraf and Prime Minister Vajpayee agreed to the fact of solving this on a basis of giving each of the regions self-governance. Now, that opportunity is still there. So I, was, I, and I believe that, uh, the, I've always said that crisis creates an opportunity. This is a crisis, and I hope this crisis gives an opportunity for India and Pakistan to ha give the opportunity for the people of Kashmir to live with, di with dignity. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Yes, I see a hand in the middle. Would you tell us your name? Sure. Uh, my name is Rohan Gupta, and I'm a senior at Herricks High School. Uh, in the light of the Pulwama terrorist attack in March and the spread of the so-called Islamic State chapters across the world, um, most prominently in Marawi in the Philippines, as well as uh, some attempts in Palestine and Kashmir as well, um, these have led to several conflicts and um, um, potential violence and threats in these areas. So my question is, what are potential solutions to preventing the Kashmir state from becoming a potential, uh, to having a situation equivalent to or potentially worse than Marawi? Well, um, I know Marawi reasonably well. And if you think about its geography, the fact there are is a weak state and weak borders. Um, it was possible for malefactors to infiltrate Marawi and cause quite a lot of disturbance, playing on traditional grievances between Manila and <clears throat> Mindanao Muslims. I don't think those conditions are quite the same in Kashmir. You can't replicate the two problems easily. But I think the question you ask is a broader one. Um, and I, I think it's one of the toughest questions we all wrestle with, and that is recognizing that we live in an age of terror, that terrorism is a fact, uh, and it is a global fact, and its origins and its manifestations take many varieties. Um, it is also a fact that we have resisted it and should continue to. But increasingly, I'd like to think we're coming to recognize that the way you resist terror is programs to try to convince people there are other ways to do business, but equally good intelligence and police and political cooperation across borders, but to keep a level of calm and reasonableness. We're going to have incidents, and we'll have them the rest of our lives. Some will be ISIS fomented or some ISIS subcontractor, but it isn't going to be the end of the world. It's just a new form of very difficult reality we have to, have to cope with. Now, in the case of Kashmir, um, India will pay a price 
for the anger, uh, assault on personality and dignity of the people of Kashmir. But that does not justify cross-border terrorism coming from Pakistan, whether it's in Kashmir, or it's in Pulyama, whether it's in Gujarat, whether it's in Bombay City. And I believe every administration in recent years has been extremely clear that the future of our relationship with Pakistan depends heavily on Pakistan taking responsibility for its own order and stopping that cross-border infiltration. Uh, this came out very clearly yesterday in the Prime Minister Modi's meeting with Trump that the policies that I've known going back to the Clinton administration are being, we are dead set against Pakistani fomented, uh, foment terrorism fomented from within Pakistan. And the question now that remains, and the question that I would have liked to have put to Imran Khan, is has Pakistan a consensus? A consensus between its military, its intelligence services, its political leadership, that enough is enough, and that terrorism must be in Pakistan's rearview mirror. I'm not sure we're there yet. Agreed. Uh, one last question from the audience. Yes, sir. So you asked uh, what should we do, and I'm, I'm trying to put this into a broader context of foreign policy in general. Um, we don't have ownership, so, um, and we don't want to be intervening. We don't want to be violating the sovereignty of other countries. So if we say that that's our policy, what could we do? Well, if you'll start with where you ended, that we don't have agency in that sense. Um, and that we are well-wishers for the future, that matter can be handled not satisfactorily. Uh, there are many good ideas. You listen to Farouk today. He's uh, very, very thoughtfully designed ideas that he would like to see Indians and Pakistanis and Kashmiris debate about how a different political future um, can be can be designed. But for the moment, if I were sitting in Washington, I think the choices are really rather limited. Um, we need not embrace what India has done, and we're not. And our, but our dialogue with India should be a dialogue that is respectful and quiet and behind closed doors, not in the public media. And what we should be arguing for I tried to summarize at the end of my remarks, and that is, for heaven's sakes, for your own good, get back to restoration of civil and political liberties, respect for ordinary rights, ending the state of exception the state lives under, and beginning to find ways to allow Kashmiris to express themselves again. Don't think you can cook up political solutions in Delhi and name leaders and put money in their pockets and they'll come out singing your music. Look in the end, it won't happen soon, but in the end it will only, there will only be a reconciliation if Kashmiris are given a chance to be part of their future as opposed to having the future designed and imposed on them. So uh, search for understanding creating room for dialogue, for different points of view. Kind of sounds like the Foreign Policy Association. <laughs> I, I want to really just take a second to congratulate President Noel Latif of the Foreign Policy Association. This has been a fantastic world leadership forum today. I'm sure you'll agree, and I just wanted to thank you. Well, this was a group effort, and I want to thank our very able staff for uh, assembling this program and executing it. And I want to thank you all for participating. Uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you.